Hey, it's another edition of uh, this series that I'm doing that doesn't really have a title and it's not really a series, but it's me talking about music, talking about bands. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a band's entire discography. Today I'm going to do Iron Maiden. For me, Iron Maiden is uh, probably in my official, non-official band rankings list. For me, Iron Maiden is number three in my all-time favorite bands. My list only goes to, to number four or five. After that, you know, it gets a little bit more difficult. But Iron Maiden, for me, I would say is number three. Uh, that's a combination of how much I like them and how much, uh, how long I've been into them and how much I still like them and just the, the biggest impact that they've had on my life, at least musically. They haven't done anything in terms of anything actually in my life, but in my life as a music fan. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about their whole discography today, and uh, I'm gonna get right to it. I'm gonna start with the first album. This was the self-titled ah, self-titled Iron Maiden album. This came out in 1980. I will say this is not my first Iron Maiden album. I got into Iron Maiden a little bit later. Some of these videos that I'm doing, some bands I got into right from the start, like Slayer. Um, other bands I picked up a little bit into their career. Iron Maiden is one of them. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So th this was their, their first album. It wasn't my first album. I went back and got these after I was already an Iron Maiden. I uh, got back this. Went back and, get, and listened to this after I had already been an Iron Maiden fan for some time. And so this came out in 1980. And it, it's kind of weird when you go back, when you, when you get into a band on a certain album and then go back. You, I don't think you see them as you as you do if you follow them in a linear fashion. But so retroactively, I love this album. This is, um, I, I would say, I mean, I could say this about a lot of Iron Maiden albums, but every song is great on this album. Maybe um, Strange World is, is maybe not too much of a favorite, but Prowler, uh, I was at the Sanctuary, if anybody knows uh, Overkill, uh, Hello from the Gutter by the band Overkill, I always thought sounded like Sanctuary, same same opening riff. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but I always thought it was. I've never heard that discussed by either Iron Maiden fans or Overkill fans, but I think Overkill, Hello from the Gutter riff, maybe they stole that from Sanctuary. Uh, a lot of these songs became staples, Sanctuary and Running Free for sure. Iron Maiden, the last song, they're... Uh, Maybe their signature song. I think they do that at every show. Every show I've seen for sure. Every tour I've seen them. That goes back a long, long time. Charlotte the Harlot is good. Now this is when their songs were still pretty short. The longest one here is Phantom of the Opera. Ah, something about Phantom of the Opera I can say. I, I never, when I listened to this album, I was not really a fan of that song until they played it live in... Um, I think it was 2013 on the tour, the tour they did in 2013. I think that was the Made in England tour. And um, I, I saw that tour in Mexico City and the, the crowd went just unbelievably crazy for that song, which made me think maybe I'm missing something. I went back and now I do love Phantom of the Opera. I I'm not sure what it was, but that's a, a classic Iron Maiden song. So a very good album for a, for a debut album, as I've said with other bands, sometimes the the debut album can be very forgettable, and I would say like with Anthrax, and other times it's their, uh, uh, and Red Hot Chili Peppers too, I think the first album. But uh, Iron, Iron Maiden's first album is very, very memorable. I love it. It's a good one. And then the second one, uh, now I have a, this is Killers. This was, I guess, 1981. I know, I think for a lot of Iron Maiden fans, this is their favorite album of the of the two. I would say most people would prefer, the first two, I think most people would prefer Killers. For me, it's not even close. I like the first album much more than Killers. Wrathchild, I love, I love Wrathchild. Other than that, the, for me, there's no song on here that, I can't say that I don't love, but that I would put in my very top Iron Maiden songs. They're, they're not... I'm not saying it's a bad album. I'm just saying, I guess people say it's overrated. I would never say that, that's stupid. But I just never got into this album. Although this was another one that I did get into after I'd already known about them. Um, Murders in the Rue Morgue is good. Purgatory is good. Killers, the title track. 
Um, but other than that, there wasn't too much that has ever really caught my attention with this album. Great, great uh, album cover though. I think one of the one of my favorite Iron Maiden album covers, or whatever that is worth. We could talk a lot about. I could do a whole video on Iron Maiden album covers. Um, but so, so for me, this one as a retro fan going back, this this was uh, it, it was fine, but not 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 as good as the first one, and not as good as this one. This is the number of the beast. This is the first album that I got into of Iron Maiden. I got. Uh, I remember I had this single, the, the 45 RPM single, and it had a of, uh, run to the hills, and it came in a really cool sleeve. Some some are some uh, 45s back end. They just came in a plain paper sleeve, but uh, run to the hills. And I remember flying high again. I had the Aussie flying high again single. That was a really cool one too, with a cool sleeve. But I had the single of that. I guess I had it first. Um, I don't know why I would have got the album first and then gone back and got the single. But, uh, oh, it had a B-side of Total Eclipse. Maybe that's why I got it. Anyway, uh, a, a friend of mine at the time, this was in, I got this in, this came out in 192 and I got 82. And I got it around that time. It wasn't a brand new album at the time, but it was their current album. Run to the Hills was on the radio a lot. And I, that was the first Iron Maiden song I ever heard. And I, I just loved it. That was why I bought the single. That was very different for me. At that time, I had only heard, um, I was 12 years old. I, I was a big Kiss fan. I'd been a big Kiss fan for seven years at that point, and I was into ACDC and Van Halen uh, and a little bit and Black Sabbath at that point. But Iron Maiden to me was was very different than there. They were, I don't know if at the time you you said heavier or if I thought that when I was 12 years old, but Iron Maiden was was more metal for sure. Their look and everything. So I got this album in 1982. So this is my introduction to Iron Maiden. Uh, it's not my favorite, but it's pretty close. Um, after all these years, I still love it. It is for sure considered their signature album. I guess everybody has their own interpretation of what that means. But for me, this is the, the, the classic Iron Man album. Again, not my best, but it is a good one. Uh, for it, this has like three pure classics. Uh, Hallowed Be Thy Name. Which I think uh, they did an online poll a year, a couple of years ago, to, to pick, or Metal Hammer did it, or something like that, to pick your favorite Iron Maiden song. And Hallowed Be Thy Name was number one. It's not my personal favorite, although I love it. And Run to the Hills, as I said, is a classic. And the title track, The Number of the Beast, that was one that I, I did get kind of tired of during the 80s, because the video was on all the time. On all the, the midweek Metal Mania video shows that were on back then. And it was... They played that video all the time, and I got tired of it, but maybe 10 or no, 15 something years ago, I rediscovered it, and I now I can never get sick of that song. I That's a song that I do listen to, The Number of the Beast, by choice. You know, sometimes you listen to songs, maybe like Enter Sandman or Rock and Roll All Night or Crazy Train, We Will Rock You, We Are the Champions. You only hear it if you're at a party or if it's on the radio or in the background. I choose to listen to The Number of the Beast, the song. It's a incredible album. Um, I, some other ones, uh, Children of the Damned is a really good one too. They brought that back uh, a few years ago. They played it on tour. They hadn't played it for years at that point. So so Number of the Beast, uh, I, th I think it was um, on the, the liner notes or on the back of the album. I don't, I guess it's in here somewhere. They had, uh, thanks to the, the Headbangers, Hell Rats, uh, what did, what did they say? Uh, this album is dedicated to Headbangers, Earth Dogs, Rivet Heads, Hell Rats, and Metal Maniacs everywhere. See you on tour. ACDC and Van Halen and Kiss and Black Sabbath weren't doing that. So I, I think as a kid, hearing Earth Dogs and Hell Rats and uh, Metal Maniacs, that, that made a, a strong impression on me. So Number of the Beast, um, close to my favorite, but not quite. You'll have to stay tuned and see what my favorite is, if you care. Next one, Peace of Mind, 1983. This was a weird one. I, I don't know why I never bought this album at the time. This came out in, in 1983. And as I said, I don't know why I bought it. The, uh, the, the single was The Trooper, and I, I, the, the Trooper was getting played all the time on, um, uh, on video shows, as I mentioned a, a few seconds ago, like Run to the Hills. And I loved it, and I heard uh, my... A friend of mine had this, and I liked it.
but I, I don't know why at the time I never bought it. Um, but, and it, it still, I, I don't dislike it. This was one that I never fully, fully embraced. It does have some great songs. Where Eagles Dare, they played that on the last tour that I saw about, uh, I guess it was about nine months ago, and they, they played Where Eagles Dare. I think it's the first time they played it in many, many years. And it was just incredible. So heavy, the drum. Very heavy, great song. Revelations was one I didn't get into until... I saw them on the uh, tour in 2008 or 7, 8, 2008 or something like that. But I do love it now. Flight of Icarus, I always loved. Die With Your Boots On is good. Trooper, eh. I, I, I do like this album. Still Life was good. Um, Quest for Fire. Maybe the worst song in the Iron Maiden catalog, at least of the Bruce Dickinson albums. Worst lyrically, anyway. Um, Dinosaurs roamed the earth. It just that was a, a bad song. Sun and Steel was okay. Uh, to tame a land. So no, in, in general, I I do like this album. Not not a classic like some others, but this is good. I I think this is again another real fan favorite. This might be my favorite Iron Maiden album cover. I love that album cover. I remember going to uh, record stores at when I was thirteen years old and uh, seeing this and picking it up. I don't know why I never bought it, but. Yeah, good album, peace of mind. A fan favorite for sure. Um, great album cover, not my favorite. You know what is my favorite though? This one, this is Power Slave. This came out in 1984. This is not just my favorite Iron Maiden album. This is um, a top 10, maybe top five album of all time. I don't know what made this so different than, uh, th this was the third album that I had bought in, in order as they came out. I bought Number of the Beast and, no, sorry, not Peace of Mind. So third album that I was into them. And I don't know why this made so much more of an impact than uh, Number of the Beast, but I don't, now I saw them on the on this tour. That was the first time I saw Iron Maiden on the World Slavery Tour in 1984. Maybe that was why I, I have a, an association, not just with the album, but with seeing them live. But this is, for sure the best Iron Maiden album, not because it's, the other ones are not as good, but just because this is so good. I love every song, even uh, I've mentioned before in some of the other videos that I've done talking about these, um, these uh, uh, bands' discographies. I'm not, generally speaking, I'm not a big fan of instrumentals. I think, it, I don't know if it, it I, I've never thought about why, I don't know if it's that I think it's lazy or if it, it's, just that I need the, the, the lyrics or the, the vocals to, to keep my interest. But even this one, uh, Lost for Words, Big Horror, Big Horror, was, uh, I loved it. Um, Ace, I would say of my, if, if I count what I would say maybe my top five Iron Maiden songs, three of them are on this album. Ace is High, the title track, Power Slave, and Rhyme and the Ancient Mariner. I'm gonna say something very bold. In the history of recorded, it's, it's hard to find a, a favorite band, big scale, and then to choose a favorite album, a little bit smaller, and then to, to pick one single favorite song of any song, it's almost impossible, but I would say, and I, I, I don't know if I mean this seriously, but in the history of recorded music, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner might be my favorite song ever. And it's, it's 13 and a half minutes. I think it's 1338 or 1341 or something like that. And when I was 14 years old, I, I loved it. And you would think as a 14 year old kid, maybe you don't have the attention span for a 13 or 14 minute song. I loved it. I learned all the words just, just as easy as I did with Aces High or Two Minutes to Midnight. And, um, Hear the rhyme of the ancient mariner, sees the eyes as he stops one of three, mesmerizes one of the wedding guests, stay here and listen to the nightmare of the sea. Uh, I, I could listen to that song. I still listen to Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner many times a year. Maybe I listen to the, the full album maybe once a year, but Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, I bet I listen to 15, 20 times a year from beginning to end. I love it. Uh, Ace is High is a, a classic, very fast paced Iron Maiden song. They opened with it on the last tour. Two Minutes to Midnight. That was one also I got a little bit tired of because it was on the radio a lot. And 
the video was, was played a lot, and Ace is High too, so I got a little bit tired of it, but I love it again now. Uh, Flash of the Blade, I, I think Flash of the Blade is a song, I think most Iron Maiden fans, Iron Maiden fans love that song. They've never played it live, as, as far as I know. No, I'm, I'm positive they've never played Flash of the Blade live. Unless maybe they, I don't know if they played it once or twice when they, when they started the early part of this tour. But I think a lot of Iron Maiden fans would love to hear Flash of the Blade live. The Duelists and Back in the Village. Those three, Flash of the Blade, The Duelists, and um, Back in the Village, are three songs I think that they've never played live, I think. And Iron Maiden does a pretty good job with, they don't mix it up from night to night like Pearl Jam, or even like Metallica, but from tour to tour they, they do a really good job of mixing it up, but I don't think they've ever played any of those. I think every Iron Maiden fan would love to hear any of those. And then the, the title track, Power Slave, tell me why I have to be a power slave. I don't want to die, oh my God, why can't I live on? Three of my maybe top five Iron Maiden songs are on this album. So that's why I would say this is one of my favorite albums ever. My favorite Iron Maiden album for sure. And, I, and also the artwork was really cool when I had this album. I remember I got it for my birthday in 1984. Maybe that's why I have an attachment to it too. No, I didn't get it for my birthday. I got tickets to their concert for my birthday. In 1984, that's what it was. But the original cover of this album, it was like, um, it was embossed, I guess. It, it had some texture to it. And if you looked closely, you can't do it on the CD um, without a magnifying glass. It had cool, you know, it was very serious. Iron Maiden albums were serious business. But it had, if you look closely, it had all these little, it said Eddie was here and it had all these little clues. And so I remember my friends and I, a friend, Jeff Simpsons, Used to we used to look at this album cover trying to find little clues. So Power Slave, top whatever album for me, best Iron Maiden album. I love this album with every fiber of my being. Power Slave. Uh, after Power Slave, they did um, well. They they did the Power Slave tour, the World Slavery tour, and I bought that shirt. I bought it at the time. I bought a bootleg, cheap bootleg outside of Maple Leaf Gardens uh, in Toronto in 1984 when I saw that tour. And I bought a great reprint of it last year at El Chopo. The, there's a heavy metal flea market in Mexico City. If you want to search my videos, you can see I've done metal videos there. And a guy was selling the uh, a Power Slave, not the same one that I had, but a, a reprint of the Power Slave um, World Slavery shirt. I bought that shirt. I love it. So they did Live After Death. They recorded it. They recorded this from, uh, I guess, four nights in Long Beach. Scream for me. Um, Scream for me, Long Beach. And they they called, I guess, the best performances of it. And then the, the, the fourth side was from England. I don't know if it was from uh, Hammersmith Odeon or something like that. But this was great. I would say this is my second favorite live album ever. My first... My favorite live album ever is Kiss Alive. That was the first album I ever got in my life in 1975. For me, Live After Death was the is was and still is my favorite live, second favorite live album ever. They, they got everything right. They had a, a huge booklet inside the album. Uh, I had seen the tour of Coach, of course, so it was you know a good memory to have when you're 14 years old, to have a, almost like a personal souvenir. I bought the uh the tour program of this tour, th those were um, those were expensive back then. They were ten or fifteen dollars, I think, and they were just big, thick, heavy—not even paper, almost like a heavy stock paper. Beautiful color pictures and everything. I bought that. I can't find it. it might be at my mother's house in in Canada. Um, but every, everything was right about this album. It had, I love the artwork too. I have this shirt. I think I have about twelve or thirteen Iron Maiden shirts. Live after death is a, a classic live album. This was the, the full set list from the, the shows that they did on this tour, um, which included Ryan and the Ancient Mariner. And they also did uh, a video of this, a home video, back when those were not the most common things. And I had that too, I had the home video. Uh, so Live After Death, another, uh, Maiden was just unstoppable at this point. In 84, 85, I don't know if there was a band that I liked more than Iron Maiden. For sure not Kiss, even though Kiss was my first. At this point, it was all Iron Maiden for me. Maybe Metallica too, but I, I think Iron Maiden for sure. Love it. Fantastic live album. And then in 1986, they continued their role with uh, Somewhere in Time. I remember this came out in September 1986. 
And Wasted Years was the first single. It had come out uh, some weeks or maybe a month or something before that. I loved Wasted Years for, from the first time I heard it. I remember thinking at the time, I was 16, I, just the lyrics of Wasted Years, to me it sounded like Iron Maiden was kind of done, like they, they were tired of touring from the lyrics. And I was thinking like they're, they're getting ready to quit. But I, I loved this album now. I would say this might be, um, as I said, Power Slave is my favorite. This could be, this could be number two. I, I think this or Number of the Beast, those are, those are my two and three. Power Slave is number one, no doubt. Um, Somewhere in Time and Number of the Beast are two and three. I'm not sure which. Maybe this might be number two. Um, fantastic album. It was a little bit different. I remember there was some discussion amongst Iron Maiden fans, because I was one and my friends were. They did have a little bit of synthesizers on this album. It didn't really bother me, but it was noteworthy, and that was at a time when this kind of pop metal or, you know, very melodic was, was becoming much more prominent. It was getting played on the radio, and I think I remember thinking, like, are they selling out? I didn't. I don't know if I actually thought that, but I... I mean, it didn't bother me, as I said. I love this album. Um, Caught Somewhere in Time. They, Iron Maiden had the best opening songs. Caught Somewhere in Time might be also in my top five album uh, Iron Maiden songs ever. Um, Wasted Years, as I mentioned, Sea of Madness. Heaven Can Wait. Ah, that's another... Oh, I really love uh, Heaven Can Wait. Really, really good song. Um, the Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner. I remember when I first... Uh, bought this album and saw the song title, I thought, what the hell is that? The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner. This is a band that had Gangland and uh, 666, The Number of the Beast, and they had this song called The Loneliness of Long Distance Runner. That made me um, wonder. But I, I do love that song. It's, it's an excellent song. Stranger in a Strange Land, what, uh, one of the very few Iron Maiden songs that fades out. I don't know how many Iron Maiden songs are that fade out. Most of them end cold, but... Um, Stranger in a Strange Land fades out. Excellent song. That's another one I wish they would bring back. They haven't done that. I don't know if they've played that live since this tour. Uh, and I did see this tour. I saw it in um, at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto. They played two nights. I only, I only went to one. Deja Vu is, an, is another good one. Alexander the Great might be, I think, the number one Iron Maiden fan that... The number one Iron Maiden song that Iron Maiden fans want to hear them play. They have never played it live. Um, I didn't like it, I think, as much as most fans did. I liked it for sure. But to me, it was another attempt at uh, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which, as I said, I couldn't love that song any more than I do. So maybe it was a little bit disappointing. But uh, Somewhere in Time, again, number two or number three for me. Maybe number two in the Iron Maiden catalog. Very good album. Um, I don't know what fans think of this album. I think it's generally regarded as a, as a, uh, a fan favorite. Uh, if anybody's watching, what do you think of this album? I love it. Next, um, continuing kind of, I would say, in the same vein as uh, Somewhere in Time, was Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. Uh, the first single from this one was Can I Play With Madness? And I didn't like that one as much. I, As I said, I, Iron Maiden was... The, the number one band in my life then. And I think I was a little bit disappointed with uh, Can I Play With Madness when it came out. I remember I, I had a cool picture disc of it. There was, uh, if anybody remembers the, the art, it was Eddie with uh, a, a head, a fist coming through his, his one temple to another, something like that. And it was in that shape. It wasn't like a round. And I gave it to uh, Jason Satterfield. Satterfield, I, I think he still has it. Hello, Satterfield. And, yeah, I was disappointed in it, but now to, to uh, balance that, the first track, Moonchild, that might be, um, I'm, I don't want to contradict myself. Ace is High, Power Slave, and um, Rhyme and the Ancient Mariner are my top three. Moonchild might be my, if, if I could round out the top, my top five Iron Maiden songs, Moonchild is, is in there for sure. Incredible song, man, that maybe my favorite Bruce Dickinson vocals are in that song, Moonshot. Infant Dreams, I liked a lot too. Can I Play With Madness, as I said, uh, I, I never, it, it was fine. I, I just didn't like it the way I did 
Wasted Years or some of the other songs. Uh, the Evil That Men Do is pretty good. Seventh Son of Seventh Son. Um, seventh Son of a Seventh Son. 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 A little bit boring, a little bit repetitive, but a good song, and they brought it back on the 2013 tour they did. That that was of all I've seen Iron Maiden, I think, 11 times. That that tour, ah, I was going to say might have been my favorite. I loved it. Uh, the Prophecy, The Clairvoyant, Only the Good Die Young, Finish It Out, The Last Three. Good, yeah, good album. Now, I, I think at the time, this was not that well received. Not just by me, but by my Iron Maiden friends. I don't think we liked this album as much as we did um, The Number of the Beast, Peace of Mind, Power Slave, Somewhere in Time. And, but I, I think now, I think fans and the band, this is considered maybe one of their top two or three albums. I, I think uh, it's maybe a little bit like Motorhead, Another Perfect Day, that the opinion kind of changed over the years. I don't remember this being extremely popular at this time. I did see them on this tour too. I was on an Iron Maiden roll for years. Uh, with uh, There's a band opening for them called Guns N' Roses, open for Iron Maiden on this tour in the first time in May 1988 and uh, I, Guns N' Roses was obviously not that big because they're opening for Iron Maiden and um, Zodiac Mind Warp, it was Zodiac Mind Warp, Guns N' Roses opening for Iron Maiden on that tour. Uh, I was still a massive Iron Maiden fan at that time. So another good album, uh, for me a little bit of a slip down but I, I didn't really have any complaints about this album. Unlike This one, No Prayer for the Dying. Um, this, I don't know, maybe at this point I was getting tired of Iron Maiden, which seems pretty hard because I, I like them so much. I don't know what it was. They, um, the, the songs here, maybe it was because um, the, the songs were a, a little bit shorter. I think also this, this was uh, Yannick Gurr's first album and maybe the fact that Adrian Smith just mentally, when, when a guy leaves your favorite band, you, you maybe, it stings a little bit or you maybe take it personally, especially when you're, I guess I was 20 when this came out at that point. Um, but the songs were definitely shorter, uh, a little simpler. Um, and maybe for me, just not as good, but this was definitely a disappointment. Although Tail Gunner, I, man, I love Tail Gunner. Again, the Iron Maiden opening songs are, are just the best. That's another one I don't think they've done for oof, 20 years, maybe. Uh, maybe they did it in the early 2000s. I would love to hear that one come back. Holy Smoke, I think, was the first single. I, I think maybe a little bit cheesy. Um, Hooks in You, Hooks in You was a good song. Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter, again, a little bit cheesy. These, these songs were, I don't know if it was intentional, but sounded... Like I said, shorter, simpler, maybe a little bit more anthemic, a little bit more rock. And as I said, just not as good. But uh, yeah, th this was the first Iron Maiden album that I was disappointed in. I didn't hate it. There was some, some good things about it. But definitely a disappointment after the run they had from uh, of, uh, Number of the Beast, Peace of Mind, Power Slave, Somewhere in Time, and Seventh Son of Seventh Son. This, this was a, a bit of a letdown. No Prayer for the Dying. Um, which they continued in that direction. Now, this one I don't have, so you'll have to imagine that I'm holding up this piece of plastic and showing it to you. The next one after uh, No Prayer for the Dying was Fear of the Dark. And that one, I, I ne that was one I, I never got into. Um, again, retroactively, I have come to like the title track, Fear of the Dark, from seeing them live all this time. And it's it's as much of a staple as uh, The Trooper and Iron Maiden, the song Iron Maiden. So, and it's good live. It's not, it's not really my favorite song, but I do like it when they play it live. Um, From Here to Eternity was on that album. Um, I can't even remember what else was on that album. Uh, I, I should be prepared. I should have come to rehearsal. We had a rehearsal meeting earlier this morning and I, and I skipped the rehearsal. And... From here to return. Oh, Be Quick or Be Dead was okay. That's off the top of my head. I know Wasted Love was on there. And Weekend Warrior. Very strange. Iron Maiden had a song called Weekend Warrior. 
But yeah, uh, I think even more disappointing than No Prayer for the Dying was uh, Fear of the Dark. I never really got into that one. That's, uh, that's all I can say about that one. Now, I'm going to cheat a little bit. The reason I'm doing this with Iron Maiden as I've done it with all these bands is because I'm... <laughs> They're the, they're the few bands of these videos that I've done of their full discography that I've bought all their albums. And I'm going to cheat a little bit because I never bought... We, we entered now the uh, in 95, I think, was... Um, I guess it was 95, the, and I can't remember the order of them. I'll put these together. The two Blaze Bailey albums, they were virtual... Uh, I can't even remember. Virtual X and then... Uh, X Factor, or I don't know, whatever it was, the, the two, that's how much I cared about them at the time, and still how much I care about them now. Uh, I was just, I hate to say it, but I was just over Iron Maiden at that point. They'd had two kind of disappointing albums, and they had a new singer, and for me, I thought, you know what, these, these Adrian Smith is gone, and now the singer is gone, and the singer is always the, uh, you know, obviously he's the voice of the band, and that's, that's what you associate with music. And when a singer leaves, that's very different than when a guitarist leaves or a drummer or something like that. And I think for, especially Bruce Dickinson, I, Iron Maiden was a great band, but Bruce Dickinson was the voice. Going back to talk a little bit about the Paul Diano era, I know there are people, I just saw a guy last week, um, this is the dangers of, of reading dumbass comments on social media. I follow a couple of Iron Maiden pages on Facebook or Instagram, and... Um, Somebody posted something about Iron Maiden, and this guy, this was just a week ago, this guy said something like, uh, they suck without Paul Deanna, or bring back Paul Deanna, or something like that. This guy is still angry. Paul Deanna has been out of the band almost 40 years. This guy is still angry. And this is similar with Mike Patton replacing Chuck Mosley and Faith No More, which I talked about in the, the last video I did, or two videos ago. Um, I, I love Chuck Mosley. I love especially very similar with Iron Maiden, the first two albums with Chuck Mosley and then uh, Mike Patton, excuse me, and then Iron Maiden, the first two albums with Paul Diano and then replace them with Bruce Dickinson. Massive steps up. These are identical cases. These are, I mean, perfect case studies in replacing singers. As good as, and as much as I love the first Iron Maiden album and the second Faith No More album with Paul Diano and uh, Chuck Mosley, they clearly, both of those bands reached a much higher level and really established themselves with their replacements with Bruce Dickinson and uh, Mike Patton. So for anybody who says that Iron Maiden, I mean, if you if you like Paul Diano better than Bruce Dickinson, I can't argue with that, but I don't know how anybody could say that Paul Diano is the, the right singer for Iron Maiden because he was uh, very, again, very similar to Chuck Mosley. He wasn't, he didn't have the big grand metal or, or uh, identifiable voice as as Bruce Dickinson. And, and so I, I'm, I'm kind of going in circles here. Now going a little bit forward to Blaze Bailey, how can you replace Bruce Dickinson? Uh, and at that point too, coming after two disappointing albums. And at that point, music was shifting too, although I still liked metal as much as anything, but also I was a, at that time a, a big Pearl Jam fan and Soundgarden. And Pantera too, I loved I loved Pantera, Goldfinger, and Iron Maiden, maybe to me at that point were getting, they were like the old guard, and I don't know, maybe I was just tired of them, but it didn't help that Blaze Bailey came and sang on those two albums. But I will say, and I feel bad because I know Blaze Bailey, he's, he's had kind of a rough go lately, and he seems like a good guy, but he, he just, uh, it's the exact same with uh, Tim, Tim Owens in uh, Ripper in uh, Judas Priest. You can't replace Rob Halford and you can't replace Bruce Dickinson. But one good thing I will say is Iron Maiden on their last tour, on the Legacy of the Beast tour, they did two Blaze Bailey songs. They did uh, Sign of the Cross and The Klansman. And I had never even, I think I had never heard those songs before. I think when they, when they started doing those early in the tour, I went back and listened to them. And... Did, again, didn't really like them, but when they did them live, man, with Bruce Dickinson, he really brings those to life. Those, I think if they had recorded those albums with Bruce Dickinson, I would have liked them a lot more. And they sounded weird, too. They didn't have, like, the Iron Maiden sound. They just were weird sounding. 
And they were really in the toilet back then. Nobody cared about Iron Maiden. They were playing in clubs. I think by the time the second uh, Blaze Bailey album came out, one show, I don't know why I remember this, they were playing the Showbox, I think, in Seattle, which holds like hundreds of people. So they went from playing arenas and multiple nights. They played two nights at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto on the Somewhere in Time tour. Somewhere on tour, it was called. And now they were playing in, uh, in little clubs with a couple hundred people with no production. They had these... Iron Maiden was famous for, and still is famous for, maybe now more than ever, with having big production. And, you know, when you're playing in these little clubs, you can't do that. So I was, I was not an Iron Maiden fan at that point. Um, some, some will say I'm not a true fan because of that, but I don't care. Now, that's enough with Blaze Bailey. Bruce Dickinson came back, I guess, in 1999, and they, they did a, a tour, kind of a, it wasn't called a reunion tour, but they, they did, I can't remember the name of that tour, and Adrian Smith came back too, and then they followed up with this gem, this was Brave New World in 2000, and this, this maybe should have been the album that came after uh, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, this was, this was what, I guess, what Iron Maiden should sound like, or should have sounded like. They were, they were back to these long, grand songs, although I did get a little bit tired of some songs were too long. Uh, the Wicker Man opened this. Again, they always had good opening songs. The Wicker Man was a fast, uh, you know, uh, energetic song. Ghosts of the Navigator is maybe my favorite song from this album. Blood Brothers has become a good anthem. They've played that, uh, I think, quite a few times over the years. They used it at the, as the, uh, they played it in the encore, I think, on the Book of Souls tour. So that's a, that's a good song. Blood Brothers, Out of the Silent Planet, I like a lot. The Thin Line Between Love and Hate uh, is the last song. Their last songs were always a little bit long. I think that one, The Thin Line Between Love and Hate, I think it was around 10, 10 or 11 minutes. Can I, can I find this? Oh, I have this insert. Um, it was, it was uh, but this, this was a very good album. I think everybody was just speaking for myself for sure. I was just happy that, that Iron Maiden, uh, Thin Line Between Love and Hate was 8 minutes, 26 seconds. Um, I, I was just happy that Bruce Dickinson was back and Adrian Smith was back. And they've had this lineup ever since. They've had this lineup now for 21 years. And so I was just, yeah, I guess aside from being a good album, it was just good to have my old Iron Maiden fan back. Plus, Yana Gers. A lot of people had a problem with him, especially live. I don't care. I think... Yeah, he's, he's very theatrical and dances and prances. I don't care. Uh, and maybe the same people that complain about him dancing and prancing are complaining about uh, Soundgarden and, and Nirvana looking at their shoes. So, But th this is an excellent album, a, a very good return to Iron Maiden, even though they never went away. It, it feels like they did, and they came back with a, with a really good album, Brave New World. It's not one of my favorites, but I do like it a lot. Um, ah, now the next one was, this is another one I don't have. This was Dance of Death. I don't know, I don't know why I can't find that. Uh, I think there's another one I can't find. I'm not sure. But Dance of Death was next. And kind of up and down, I, I never cared about Dance of Death. Which is, I don't know why, because I liked um, uh, Brave New World so much. I don't know why I was so... Maybe that's why I was so disappointed in Dance of Death. Maybe also the album cover, that's... I, I think everybody would agree if you did a vote on the worst Iron Maiden album cover, Dance of Death for sure was, was the worst. Um, and it's not like you look at the album cover and go, I hate this album cover, so I hate the music. Although I'm sure there are people that are like that. But I, I think, you know, the album cover, it does attract, you know, a good album cover can attract people and a bad one, I guess, can, can maybe push them away. For whatever reason, uh, I didn't like the album. And the, the only song I even remember, I, I guess the first song was Wildest Dreams. Or, uh, I think it was. And Passchendaele was a good song. But other than that, there's, there's really not too much I can say about uh, Dance of Death. It just, uh, maybe I should listen to it again. Sometimes when you talk about these things, you, you, maybe you need just some time away. It's like a relationship. But Dance of Death never did anything for me at the time. Uh, not much else I can say about that. Kind of incomplete. Not that it's a bad album. I'll just have to give it an incomplete. Uh, now the next one was uh, A Matter of Life and Death. This is kind of the same for me as um, 
as Dance of Death. One thing that I did like better about this was that it was um, uh, it was a double, it was it was a single album, but they had this bonus DVD that had the making of the album, which I that was very appealing to me. And I, I haven't watched that for a long time, and I don't remember much about it, but I remember I did like it. Iron Maiden always did cool things like that. Uh, this, but the, musically, this was another one I never really got into that much. Um, the reincarnation of Benjamin Brieg, that was the first single, and I did, I did like that one. Probably still my favorite song on this album, just looking at the track list, I, I don't really, I, I recognize all the titles, but I, if, if you put the song on, Different World, you always remember the opening songs. Um, I, I don't really remember too much about this album. I remember it was very controversial because when they toured behind this, they played the whole album. From beginning to end and people were very pissed about that a lot of people were expecting uh i don't know rhyme of the ancient mariner or uh uh two minutes to midnight or where eagles there or something and instead they got this whole album uh which is long it's maybe about a 70 minute album and they got this and maybe a few hits iron maiden trooper uh hallowed be thy name fear the dark and that was it so this this was a lot of people weren't happy with this tour i didn't see this tour um, I'm not sure if they, I lived in Mexico when this came out. This, this is where my Iron Maiden Mexico career started. I don't know if they played Iron Maiden on this, on this tour. Um, I think they didn't. I think they didn't. Um, but that's it. So a matter of life and death, not too much I can say about that. Now, um, after that, they did, speaking of playing Mexico, this is when, I guess, I guess they had started with that kind of reunion tour in 99 where they started to do this uh, alternate, they did like a like a retro tour and then a new album and tour and then a retro tour. And in 2008 they did, uh, it was called Somewhere Back in Time. And it, it was, the, the idea was, uh, was it that one? Was it called Somewhere Back in Time? Um, yeah, Somewhere Back in Time. But kind of, kind of a mix because the tour was called Somewhere Back in Time, but the theme of it was basically like recreating the, the Power Slave theme, which I'd say, I would say those two albums, Power Slave and Somewhere Back in Time, as I mentioned, was probably Iron Maiden's peak. Um, so I saw them on this tour in Mexico City in February 2008. That was the first time I had seen Iron Maiden since 1988. So I went 20 years without seeing Iron Maiden, and this put me back into hardcore Iron Maiden um, fan. Not not this album, but the tour they did, Somewhere Back in Time, which they recorded this live album. I ended up seeing them twice on that tour. They played in Mexico City the next year, in, in uh, also in February 2009. So they basically somewhat recreated the uh, Power Slave tour, and uh, just incredible. Ace is High, Two Minutes to Midnight, same way that they started the, the World Slavery tour set list. Revelations was also from it, The Trooper. Wasted Years obviously was a little bit different. Number of the Beast, Can I Play With Madness was obviously an addition because they didn't have that at the Somewhere Back in Time or World Slavery Tour. Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, ah, so great to hear that song again. That was the, the first time they had played it live since I don't know when, for, for, a long, for years at that point. Power Slave, they did Heaven Can Wait. Um, so, so this is the first time I had seen Iron Maiden in 20 years, and they were doing all my favorite songs. This is probably their their best set list was on uh, was on this tour. Heaven Can Wait, Run to the Hills, Fear the Dark. Of course, Iron Maiden, Moonchild. Oh man, they I don't think they had done Moonchild maybe since the Seventh Sun tour. So it was great to hear Moonchild again. As I mentioned, one of my maybe top four five songs. I loved it. I would say. As I said earlier, um, Live After Death might be my second favorite live album ever. I might even like this better than Live After Death. I, it, it doesn't have the same impact and everything as Live After Death. The only down thing is the album cover. That, that, it's not a good, uh, it's not a, it, you need uh, Derek Riggs or Eddie or something. But uh, Flight 666 was the name of this, uh, the, uh, this live album. And they, they also released, uh, just like they did with Live After Death with a, a, an accompanying video. And I probably watched that video more than I've watched uh, Live After Death. Just very different eras. Back at Live After Death, they were, I guess, in their 
20s, mid, mid-20s, something like that, and here they were in their early or mid-50s. But, oh, this was incredible. I really liked the way they did it, too. Each song was taken from a different uh, night of the tour, a different city. Um, Aces High was from Mumbai, India, I remember. Two Minutes to Midnight maybe was from, uh, I can't remember. Revelations was from Perth or Sydney, somewhere in Sydney, I think, Australia. Um, Number of the Beast was from L.A. Can I Play with Madness was from here in Mexico City. Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner is from New Jersey. This version, the, the video version of, of Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, is just incredible. I watched that. I'm getting off topic a little bit because I'm not talking about the album, but the, the video version of the album. Um, to see how the people singing and just headbanging like crazy to Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, that so many people, not that I was the only one, but people singing along to a 13 and a half minute song was uh, excellent. I... Love this album. Love it, love it, love it. A classic live album. And very important because it got me really back into like hardcore Iron Maiden fan status. I had wavered on them for about 20 years. This welcomed me back. This is uh, like Godfather 3. Just when I... No, what does he say? Just when I think I'm out, they pull me back in. I was going to try to act it out like Al Pacino or even like uh, Silvio Dante from The Sopranos. But I'll just say I, I love this album. Fantastic. Uh, after that, The Final Frontier. Um, I feel like I'm missing something, but I, I guess I'm not. Ah, no, I'll, I'll go back a little bit and say they had many um, compilation and other live albums. I'm only, I never bought those. I'm only going to talk about the ones that I bought, which is most of them anyway. So The Final Frontier, this came out in uh, 2011. I, I think a lot of fans didn't like this one. I, I had no problem with it. I thought it was pretty good. I for sure liked it better than Dance of Death and A Matter of Life and Death. Uh, El Dorado was the first song. That's a, man, that's a modern day Iron Maiden classic. That's as good as it gets with Iron Maiden post 2000. I, I love El Dorado. Fantastic song. The opening track was Satellite 15, The Final Frontier. Satellite 15 was also great. Uh, Nico McBrain's, Nico McBrain's drums are just thunderous. They sound like, uh, Kiss in, in, uh, Creatures of the Night. Just, like thunder, just pounding heavy drums, fantastic. Um, coming home, Starblind was good, The Talisman, When the Wild Wind Blows. Yeah, pretty good album. I, I think a lot of fans don't like it, but I uh, I liked it a lot. Now I did see them on this tour. They played they played in Mexico City the night before I got married. So I saw Iron Maiden the night before I got married. I got home at two or three in the morning and woke up and got married the next day. My, um, in some ways, that was my favorite Iron Maiden concert just for that reason. And also because I went with my, um, my brother was here visiting from, from Toronto from, uh, for, for the wedding and my brother-in-law and my old friend who I'd seen Iron Maiden with back in the eighties, Pete was here for the wedding and a good friend of mine, Tom, who I'm, I was supposed to go visit in Arizona in April, but it got canceled because of coronavirus. And I'm still going to go see him hopefully in September. So we, the five of us went, and so for that, it was a great time. This was the first time ever in my life when I saw them on this tour that I missed part of the concert. I was always, I'm very prompt and punctual, and I'm never toddy, and, but I missed this one. Horrible traffic in Mexico City. It took us a long time to get there. We got there, I think, three in the third or fourth song or something. So in that way, it was my favorite Iron Maiden tour, but... In another way, it was the worst. The worst sounding concert I've ever heard. You you could have a conversation during the concert just using this voice and hear your friend perfectly. The sound was almost inaudible. It was so quiet. And people were just sitting there and very lifeless. And they did a lot of songs from this album, which a lot of people, as I said, it, it's not a, a, you know, seeing them do these newer songs is not the same as seeing them do uh, uh, Phantom of the Opera. So anyway, so Final Frontier, very good. And I like the album cover. I don't know what people think of that, but I liked it a lot. Um, Predator Eddie, they, <clears throat> excuse me, they, you know, he, he maybe looked a little bit like like Predator, like an alien. But uh, I, I have no problem with this album. The cover, the music, the tour uh, was, was maybe not the best, but anyway, I liked it. And then the result of that tour was this, another live album. Iron Maiden has more live albums than anybody, I think. Not Pearl Jam, who did live albums after every show, or Metallica, but actual releases. I think they always did, uh, 
uh, a live album after every tour they released it. So they did this one and a video too. I love it. Iron Maiden did, did it's cool to be an Iron Maiden fan. So they did this. Yeah, the set list was uh, Satellite 15, which was pre-recorded. Final Frontier. Maybe not the best Iron Maiden opening song. That one was a little bit more uh, mid-tempo. It didn't have the energy, I think, of Ace is High or um, Moonchild or Somewhere Back in Time. Uh, El Dorado was great. I think it was El Dorado when we got in when I said that we were late. I think it was El Dorado. So we missed the first two songs. Two Minutes to Midnight, Talisman from the new album, from um, Final Frontier coming home from their album. Dance of Death, Trooper, of course, Wicker Man, Blood Brothers, as I said. That kind of became a modern day classic from Brave New World, When the Wild Wind Blows. And then after that, it was, the, it was classics. The Evil Dead Man Do, Fear of the Dark. Iron Maiden, Number of the Beast, Hell Be Thy Name, Running Free. Probably the, the weakest Iron Maiden set list, uh, at least from, from tours that I saw. But I, I still like it. it it's, uh, Iron Maiden live albums are good. And the video was, uh, was cool too. Did they do a video? I think they did. Yeah, they did. I remember what the stage looks like. It was kind of a weird looking stage, kind of silver. Um, anyway, yeah, so En Vivo was the name of this album. And of course it was a, it was a double album. Then they, they kind of went back and dug out something from the vault. This was, they called this Made in England 88. They had done a home video after the Seventh Son of a Seventh Son tour. They recorded it in, in, uh, in London, I think, or Birmingham. And um, so the tour that they did was, was kind of similar to the Somewhere Back in Time tour. And the, uh, no, this was the Made in England tour. Um, this was, uh, I think, yeah, it was Birmingham in 1988. So they had recorded this in 88, but only put it out, I think, in 2013 or something like this. Uh, I wish, I, I one thing that's really missing in Iron Maiden's catalog is that they never, as I mentioned earlier, I think about two and a half hours ago, it feels like how long this is, um, that this was one of my favorite Iron Maiden tours. But they, ne they never did uh, a live album for it or a video, but they, they did release this old one. I thought they were going to do a new one for it, that's why they called this specifically Made in England 88, and then I thought there was going to be Made in wherever they were going to call it. Uh, I can never remember what that tour was called. Um, I think it was called Made in England in 2013. Um, but yeah, this I didn't listen to too much. I think on this album they played really fast, or at this point in their career, they were playing pretty fast, uh, kind of like how Kiss did in the 83, 84, around that era. Um, good set list, because this was all, this was only up to the first six albums or something. This was the Seventh Son of the Seventh Son tour. So, so good, good set list for sure. All old stuff. If you like old stuff, this is the one. Um, but good one. Uh, I just a little bit disappointing that they didn't do one for the tour, that the retro tour that they did at the time. Next was the Book of Souls. You notice this is the, uh, I bought the deluxe edition of the Book of Souls, which is really, really cool packaging. Uh, like a book, almost like a, like a DVD case. And then inside it was this uh, really nice, Iron Maiden, was, as I said, it was really good with so many things. I think that's why they were so, so successful. Not just the music, not just Eddie, but they, they Rod Smallwood, you know, their manager for their whole career. I think he's maybe has a big hand in that. But look at look at this. This this was a really cool hardcover book with um I I think well I have the lyrics and mixed with some uh some some artwork. Where is it? Here's uh I, I think they they maybe really really cool stuff here. Um, I, I think they maybe dropped the ball with this, that they, I remember when this came out, I thought this, this album cover sucks. And a couple of my friends said, no, nah, it's great. And I, I agree that Eddie is great. That's a really cool looking Eddie. But to me, they, they missed so much by just having this black background. Like I thought they could have had some cool theme or something, but then they did inside the album. For me, this is one of, uh, that's one of my favorite Eddie Images or Eddie paintings or drawings ever. I love that and I have a shirt of this um, and I did see them on this tour, too um, Well, first of all about the album. I love this album. This is this is a this was their last Their most recent I can't say it's their last because they're not 
they're still an active band and I think they'll probably do another album. But this is the last album that they've done to this point. This is 2015. And for me, this is for sure the best. You, you kind of put Iron Maiden, just like with Kiss, you put them in the different eras. And if you count the era of when Bruce Dickinson and Adrian Smith came back in 99, of the albums they did, Brave New World, Dance of Death, Matter of Life and Death, Final Frontier, and um, Book of Souls, this is for sure my favorite. This has, if eternity should fail, the red and the black, the book, the title track, the Book of Souls and Empire of the Clouds, those are as good as any four Iron Maiden songs you'll hear just about. And then they had a couple of other good ones. Speed of Light was pretty good. Great Unknown. Uh, when the River Runs Deep. Death or Glory was another good one. Maybe not quite the classic, but that was a good one. Climb Like a Monkey Out of Hell. Strange lyrics, but it was fun. Uh, Shadows of the Valley, I, I don't remember that one too. I oh, know that one was good too. Ah, that was, I think, the one that sounded like uh, the opening, the guitar sounded like Wasted Years. Tears of a Clown sucks. That, that's one of the worst Iron Maiden songs. Uh, and I, I couldn't believe they did that on this tour. It was such a slow, for me, just not very interesting song, just, just nothing there. And it had no energy. It wasn't just slow. I mean, uh, Hallowed Be Thy Name is kind of slow too, but it's it's a great song. I'm, I, I couldn't believe that they played Tears of a Clown on that on that tour. Uh, Man of Sorrows, I don't remember too much. Empire of the Clouds. I'm going to talk about Empire of the Clouds. It's 18 minutes and 3 seconds. I know that for a fact. I've, I've listened to that song, I, I want to say as much as any Iron Maiden song, as a specific song. Many times... I just put that song on it. You know, it's 18 minutes and three seconds, so it's hard to listen to this as a full album when it ends with an 18 minute song. But Empire of the Clouds, and I remember when they announced the track listing, I, I was, ah, oh, like, when, when they announced that they were making their albums longer. Iron Maiden albums were 70, 72, 73 minutes. Now they were releasing this as a double album. And there were, you know, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner was their longest song in 1984, and that was 13. Now they had another song on here that was as long as that, and then another one that was that was 1803, and the Book of Souls is also 10 or 10 and a half, and I thought, that's just too much. And when I heard, you know, they said Empire of the Clouds, excuse me, was, um, there was Bruce Dickinson wrote the whole thing, that it was piano, and it had cello and strings, and it was different than any era than either main album, I thought, oh, that's pretty interesting. And then I heard it, I remember very, oh, I can remember so well where I was when I first heard it. I, went, I was out for a walk, I took this album out for a walk with my headphones and walked around for a couple of hours. And when it got to this, it started, and I listened, and it ended, and I thought, that's it? That, that's, that's the 18 minute song? It was very disappointing, it, it really didn't do anything for me. And then I don't know what happened, I don't know if it was, I, I think maybe the next time I listened to it, I sat down with, this beautiful booklet, and um, and and read the lyrics, and I think that was a really did it. It's a, it's a movie. This song is. I I hate saying epic, but it's it's a huge song, not just long. It's so grand, and it's um, it, it's got so many different moods, and and you can imagine that this this was a movie, um. I, I love that song. That's That might be my fifth, I would, let's say my top five Iron Maiden songs. Um, Rhyme and Ancient Mariner, Ace is High, Power Slave, Moonchild, and Empire of the Clouds. Empire of the Clouds is just incredible. Uh, if you've got 18 minutes and three seconds to spare, go listen to it right now. I don't know who I'm talking to because I know nobody's probably listened to this, especially people don't care too much about Book of Souls. They want to hear about Number of the Beast. Empire of the Clouds is incredible. To ride the storm to an empire of the clouds. Uh, soaring vocals. And the middle part, that, that SOS part, the ding, 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 I don't know how they did that. It's, it's impossible to follow. You, you, when you kind of are, are dun, 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 like this, doing this in your head, it's impossible. I've heard this song I don't know how many times and I still can't get it. Obviously in the studio they have some cues or maybe they did some 
trickery to put it together. This song will never be played live, but uh, oh man, Empire of the Clouds is fantastic. Um, so yeah, Book of Souls, top Iron Maiden album. Very, very good Iron Maiden album. And yeah, I did see this tour. They played uh, two nights in Mexico City in February or March 2016, and I, I went to one of them. And I loved it. That was, at that point, the best Iron Maiden show I've seen. In terms of production, they, they kept getting better and better. They kind of had backdrops before, but now every song was like a play. They had uh, the thing with the, the title track, Book of Souls, with Bruce Dickinson ripping Eddie's heart out and throwing it into the crowd. It was just fantastic. And Hallowed Be Thy Name on that tour was really cool, too. And so, yeah, Book of Souls was an excellent tour. As far as new album tours go, Amazing. I, oh, they also played Power Slave on this tour, which was great. So I don't want to talk about my Iron Maiden concert history, but I'll go back to this. Book of Souls is a fantastic Iron Maiden album um, and their most recent one. So that's promising. And who knows what's going to happen with the next Iron Maiden album. Supposedly it's finished. It's been finished for quite some time. The rumors say they finished it like a year ago and they're sitting on it. I don't know if that's true or not. These kind of things have a tendency to be true. Ah! Book of Souls. Now, almost one one that I almost forgot about. Very, again, very cool that they commemorated the Book of Souls tour, which was a really good tour with the live album and live video. So they called this the Book of Souls live chapter. This is, uh, I don't know how many live Iron Maiden albums I have. This one, Flight 666, live after, I, at least four. Uh, this one was good too. Like I said, the, the this was an excellent tour. And yeah, If Eternity Should Fail, Speed of Light, Wrath Child, Children of the Damned was cool to hear again. Death or Glory, I didn't like it that much on the album on Book of Souls, but it was very cool in the video that the monkey, like I said, Bruce Dickinson, the fans were doing the climb like a monkey out of hell. Uh, Red and the Black, oh, I didn't really talk about that. Red and the Black is another really, really good Iron Maiden song. I love it. That's a killer song. Um... I, I'm going to listen to I haven't listened to the whole album Book of Souls for a long time because it's so long. It's like an hour and a half. But I think I'm going to have to do that soon. Power Slave, as I mentioned earlier, was back for this tour. Loved it. The Great, the great Unknown, they maybe could have done without that. But other than that, On Blood Brothers was the second to last song they did in the encore. Um, so this is a good one. And there was a live video of it too. I don't, I don't think they actually released the live video as a physical product. I think they only put it on YouTube and... Um, Maybe you could download it like on Apple Music or Apple TV or whatever it's called. I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, this, this is pretty good. Great tour and a good, uh, a good souvenir, a good memory of that tour. And the video is really cool too. So that's it. That was a long one. That's the end of uh, the Iron Maiden discography review. I don't think I missed anything. Maybe uh, From Fear to Eternity, it was a compilation album or The Best of the Beast or... Death on the Road, a couple of those compilation live albums. I never bought those, but I only was going to talk about <clears throat> the ones that I that I bought myself. All right, and that's it. Uh, for anybody who watched the whole thing, thank you, and also my condolences, although I'm sure that's not more than one person. But uh, that's it for Iron Maiden. I've got a couple more of these. I, I think I'm going to do two more of these with some other bands. You might be able to understand or to guess who it is if you were paying attention or maybe a few clues but that's that's it for Iron Maiden discography I hope there's a new album coming soon that if the rumors are true it's in the can but other than that it's uh it's a nice beautiful sunny day as it always is here and I'm gonna uh I'm gonna go out and, and take a walk and listen to some music maybe it'll be Iron Maiden see ya